Welcome everyone joining around the world and of course welcome everyone for joining Asta Howlers episode 25 securing your critical infrastructure and yes of course we are still doing this live so I'm super excited to to introduce this and, and drive this forward of course it's a pleasure to host you all again for those who don't know me my name is James Aliband I'm a serious senior security strategist and manager of product marketing at VMware now, before we dive into this session, remember this is a cybersecurity expert roundtable. This is where I bring trusted advisors and security strategists to discuss the latest threats and security challenges, providing actionable tips and resources. And of course, most importantly, we're here to answer your questions. Last time out, it was so awesome and so good to be joined by Sonara Marsh and David Zenzian discussing adding the SEC into DevSecOps. What a great session we had. We had two great members of the VMware family that we were able to bring out to you guys and to make sure that, uh, you know, of course, we can answer your questions and really answer the, some of the challenging areas that we, we, we talk about, of course, on this session. Now, just before I introduce my guest, I want to remind you, of course, we have the Q&A running as well. So this is the, here to be able to answer your questions live today. We'll answer them for you, those in, a, in a, just a little bit later time. Also, my ask here as always, and I'm gonna start doing this every single session, when you're posting the Q&A, tell me the country or the state that you're listening from. I wanna know where you are in the world. Are you watching the Euros at the moment, of course, in Europe? Or out, are you out in the US? Are you out in APJ? What time zone are you watching this on? I want to see how much reach we're getting on these sessions. So please tell me where you're listening from. And then, of course, ask your questions as well. And let's get those questions coming in today. So with no further ado, I'm so excited to introduce my guest today. He, of course, has a British accent like myself, but also lives in the US. And no doubt we'll find more about that, uh, of course, today. So with that, Let's introduce my guest. I'm so excited to welcome Craig Savage onto the live stream today. Thank Craig, you. yeah, Craig, thank you for joining me today. This is, I'm so happy. I've been pushing to get you on. I know I have, and uh, and I know also that you're uh, you actually are going on holiday tomorrow as well. So we've rescheduled this to make sure that we can get you on. So thank, thank you for you. joining me. Glad you think of it as a holiday. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I'm seeing it as a holiday vacation, but I'm sure we'll learn. Um, more about that in that sense. Craig, just before we join in, I really want to know, and I always do this, so you you, you know you you know this. Um, if you could purchase anything in the world, doesn't matter in cost, let's not let's forget that side. What would you purchase and why? Well, I gave this quite some thought. Um, and I yeah, we, we could go with the twee, you know, you could go with the I would like to purchase world peace. Um but I thought, <laughs> that, that's a bit rubbish. Um, and you know, not something you purchase, it's something you earn, I think. Um, I think so, yeah. So, I've actually got two answers for you. This is because I, as with everything, I dissect the question. So, if it was something I could purchase easily here in Colorado in any quantity I wanted to, it would be my favorite South African delicacies. Um, I had, I had a really good South African shop in Bristol when I lived in the UK uh, that managed to keep me supplied of Biltong, Drovos, and Borovos. And uh, as yet, have struggled to find somewhere decent in the U US to, uh, to do the same. So I miss that, and I'd like that. Um, if it was to actually yeah. buy a thing, um, what I'd really like is an old 1930s uh, Liberty pickup truck, uh, which I would restore and get running. So that would be. I like my... the restore part as well. I think it makes it really personal, doesn't it? When you can when you go through that whole process. It's um, important to me because yeah. I spend so much time in front of a computer, so much time thinking about all this, you know, IT stuff to, to actually kind of go into the garage, get the tools out, at wrenches, as the Americans say, spanners, as we in the U UK <laughs> say. <laughs> and, uh, and actually Tomatoes, get, tomatoes. Uh, yep, exactly. Get some time working on some, some old-fashioned stuff that, you know, just works. It's important as well, isn't it? It, it just made me think as you said that, and I think it's, you know, and maybe away from today's topic, but it's really important when we think about, you know, for me, I've worked from home for a long time, for a long time. I've never worked from home five days a week for 15 to 16 months. Mm. 
And I think you've, what you've just said there around getting away from the computer, going to do something that is uh, completely different, whether it's in the garage, whether it's out for a run, whether it's whatever that might be, like mentally stimulating you from that point of view. I think that's a, a really important thing. And I think kind of taking that to the next level of what you just said, it just got my brain thinking. I was like, how important is that for all of us and everyone that's listening as well? Just to step away for now and again and say like, you know what, I'm going to do something different today. I'm going to, you know, Saturday afternoon, I'm going to do this because it doesn't have anything to do with my work life, which is good in a sense, uh, and to make sure we step away. It's so um, important, especially at the moment with the security world being so busy, there's just yes. so much going on and you constantly feel under pressure, especially as an operational security person. You know, every day there's something in the news about some new, you know, cyber attack or some new ransomware or, and so you kind of you, you're constantly reminded of work you, you really are you know whether it's for me you know obviously out here um you know whether it's me almost waking up to it to a certain extent or for you probably seeing it in the day or seeing it through the night like you're absolutely right you know we we kind of spoke about this um, the other day and, and it was really makes sense because you kind of get to the point where you know from my point of view in my job like we're we're obviously responding to these ransomware attacks and and talking about them um but also like how many do you, where, where do you draw the line like where do you kind of say these are ransomware attacks but they're kind of the same but different you know in in that sense and you know when it when does the light and and you know that sets me up perfectly to kind of jump into the session but just before we do that because there's sure. a few areas that i and you know that i want to touch on and i want to learn more so we're going to talk about you first and then we're going to talk about um cyber security and ransomware and, and everything of course, why people are listening in today. Um, Craig, just give us a 30 second overview of you first. Who are you? Um, where are you based? What do you get up to on the weekend? We might have had a little snippet into that already. <laughs> uh, so, so yes, yeah, so I'm Craig Savage. I'm a senior security strategist. Uh, I recently got promoted, so my, my job title might still be incorrect in some cases. Thank you. Congratulations. Uh, you did as well, so congratulations to you as well. Thank you. Um, it's that time of year at VMware. Um, I have been in IT since probably the mid nineties. Um, started out uh, down the IT side, uh, as again, some people who start down the sort of application development side. Yeah. So, you know, I started off building networks, repairing desktops, repairing servers, kind of moved my way up the IT support side of things. Um, took a job with a company in the UK in early 2000s. Uh, realized their IT security was terrible, <laughs> um, made enough of a noise about how terrible it was that they made me responsible, uh, listen that day, um, <laughs> for fixing it um, and spent the next you couple of years. You go fix it then, yeah. Yeah, next couple of years trying to fix it. I learned a heck of a lot of lessons um, and then kind of progressed from there. Um, consultant with various of the big consultancy companies, um, did some time with another, you know, a couple of smaller companies in the UK and then joined VMware, kind of, you know, the usual IT, I guess, you know, yeah, I'll be there, you know, two to four years probably, then I'll move on. Yeah, here I am, seven years later, nearly eight. Seven years. Uh, and, that's, that's a, and that's a good point because that that's, you know, one of the, I think one of the areas that, because obviously you're based, as, as we said, you're based in Colorado at this moment in time. And, and, and you know, for all of our listeners out there, because you do have that wonderful British accent, which I'm, I'm happy that you've, uh, you know, of course, kept as well. Um, but how did that happen for you? You joined VMware in Bristol, but of course, working for working for VMware in the UK. Um, so tell me a bit, tell me a bit about that, and what took you to to Colorado? Um, it was me opening my big mouth again. I think um, I I so we got a, a, a VMware session, a VMworld session. Sorry. Um, on the topic because I was I was helping customers all across the EMEA region. Uh, for VMware doing cloud transformation. So basically looking at people and process because um, I, I love stuff to do with people um, and I'm very interested in, in that people and process interaction, yeah. uh, which sounds a bit weird for someone who's in a technology company, but we have to exist. Otherwise, it's all about tech and that never works. Um, yeah, some of us. <laughs> <laughs> so I was very interested in, you know, I, I background in psychology. I'd done industrial engineering at university. I'd never finished that degree. Uh, the, the call of earning a salary got to me <laughs> before the, uh, the finish line. Um, and I submitted a VMworld session on the topic of um, 
transforming security. How do you transform a security function uh, based on, you know, we were talking about how to operationalize cloud with our customers, but one of the things that we didn't touch on a great deal was how do you operationalize security? I um, mean, you know, how do you bring security up to the cloud spec, if you like, uh, much like you bring your operational team up to cloud support levels. And uh, so I submitted this session, and uh, Brad Doctor, our Senior Director for Infrastructure and, and Architecture uh, Engineering, Security Engineering here at VMware, he'd submitted something very similar. And uh, the VMworld organizers introduced us to each other and said, hey, you, you're both talking about sort of similar topics, but one of you from the VMware lens and one of you from the customer lens. Do you want to join up and do a joint session rather? And uh, so we had a couple of calls. And we were like, yeah, we actually get on really well. This will work. We'll do a great session. And um, while I was in the US presenting with Brad at VMworld, we got to talking and I was sort of telling him some of the ideas that I'd like to, you know, I, I think a security function should be doing. And Brad yeah. was like, hey, that sounds a lot like, you know, what myself and Alex Toshev are doing. Um, so we went uh, kind of like a, I got invited along to their team dinner. Uh, which was really cool because um, I don't know if you've been to VMworld in the US, certainly when you go from the UK, you don't normally have many of your peer group with you because it's quite a privilege to to travel um, to that from EMEA especially. Um, so I was kind of like, yeah, I get to have dinner with people I can talk to rather than by myself in the hotel. Part of the team. <laughs> um, and yeah, and got to talking, you know, again to Brad and got to meet Alex, chat to him as well. Um, and it sort of came around, they're kind of like, hey, do you want to, do you want to think about a job in information security at VMware? And that's kind of like, well, yeah, it sounds interesting. Um, you know, do something different. And um, so I joined the team. The plan was to keep me UK based. Um, but about three months in, I uh, kind of had one of those conversations with Brad. It's like, hey, what would you think about moving to the US? And I'd kind of always wanted to go to the US. Um, yeah. So I was like, hey, you can twist my arm real easy. <laughs> um, <laughs> Kind of on the table. Yeah. Um, so, you know, at that time, VMware was still doing, uh, you had to be based near one of the VMware offices. Um, yeah. So the options were, you know, the Atlanta, Austin, Palo Alto, or Denver. And I was kind of like, well, I've never really, I, you know, I've heard of Denver, but I never really, I don't think most people overseas know just how big uh, Denver is. Um, so I, I didn't. Um, so one of the things with the VMware relocation program is they give you what they call a scouting trip. So you and your spouse uh, get to go to the proposed relocation area and take a look around. And, and that's what we did. And we came out to Denver and I was like, hey, this, this is it's really cool here. <laughs> it genuinely is. Um, very similar climate and altitude and everything to where I grew up in Johannesburg in South Africa. Um, yeah. Very different, obviously, to the UK, uh, which my wife is delighted about. She's British. Um, she's, you know, born and bred in Bristol. And um, we get somewhere in excess of 300 days of sunshine a year here in, in Denver. And that was very, very <laughs> enticing for my wife. Uh, she was they sold busy. you. Oh, yeah. So the relocation, uh, re relocation scouting trip, the weather, um, joining the team. Continuous team dinners. That's what I'm hearing. Um, yeah, I think all of those the were. The pandemic got in the way of that. Um, yeah, well, the pandemic did that, didn't yeah. it? Um, yeah, the pandemic certainly did that. I did a lot of traveling when I was based in EMEA. Um, literally all the way down. I was helping customers all the way from South Africa, Israel, um, up into the Scandinavian countries. Um, so it's like almost every week I was on a plane going somewhere. So one of the, the <clears throat> attractions of, of moving team and then moving here was to kind of reduce that travel load a little. Um, I quite like travel, but traveling every week gets a bit heavy going. <laughs> yeah, it, take, it takes um, its toll, right? And, and, and that's, that's the interesting point as well, is it, uh, you know, as, as, as you've just said, and I'm just kind of thinking again, like you say you reduce your travel, but to do that, you had to move 5,000 miles or, or whatever, whatever the, uh, the, the, the distance was, of course, in that sense. Craig, just, and, and I want to jump into the topics here. I know that, you know, there's, and there's a lot, uh, you know, of course, around VMware, and we'll, we'll certainly dig into them. But in one of the areas, um, I think we really scoped up for this session, and one of the areas I, I really want to pick your brains on today is around, you know, your security strategist by day, right? And, 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 and I think that's, you know, from that point of view, is really seeing that from your lens is really important to all of our listeners. So what I want to discuss about today, and I want to really drive this from a, I get a, hot, a really hard notion here and, and kind of take off from 
when we did the Global Security Insights Report session with Tom Kellerman and Rick, Rick McElroy, um, we really spoke about cyber insurgency. We really spoke about, let's think about, you know, as you said, like the, the pandemic and um, hearing about ransomware attacks just every single week. Like it's almost becoming weirdly the norm in, in that sense, especially for us in our in our world. So, you know, for everyone listening and they're seeing about these large scale um, supply chain attacks and ransomware attacks. Why do you think, um, and, and one area I think we really need to think about, but I really want to ask you this is, why do we think during the pandemic this has really come to a head? What, why, why do we think that? Um, why do I think? I, I think much like most of us, um, a lot of the cyber criminals uh, took a hit to their income stream. Yeah. Um, and much like the successful companies out in the world, and you know, don't don't for an instant think that they're, they're staffed with stupid people. Uh, they're staffed with some of the best and brightest. Bluntly, um, they pivoted and they went, "Hey, where do we get the money from?" Um, you know, we're sick and tired. Because you think about it, ransomware has been around for quite a long time, right? But sure. they tended to focus on the home user. Yeah. So it's somebody at home doesn't really know what they're doing. Clicks the link in an email. Suddenly they get the screen saying, "Hey, your computer's been locked." Send us a hundred dollars and we'll unlock it. Um, that that was the ransomware mo for ages. Um, and I think what they realised is now actually, if we start doing, if we start treating this like a business, and you know, much like most businesses, you research your customer. What they're looking for is businesses that have got money, got cyber insurance, and are likely to pay. Uh, you know, so interrupting their operations is catastrophic. And that's what they've targeted. And and they've they've had some case points. You know, Maersk a couple of years ago was a classic one. Um, yeah. I can't remember the, the name of the aluminium factory also up in the Nordics a couple of years ago. Uh, that was very interesting. Um, they went to manual processes to recover, which was very clever of them, frankly. An amazing way of avoiding the impact. Because um, I don't know if you know this, but if an aluminium plant shuts down, uh, you basically go and build a new plant because all of yeah. that molten aluminium just sets and you, you're done. Build a, new, build a new factory. So luckily for Start them... From the ground know, up. It's a good fun thing to go and look up on YouTube um, because you can see all these all the guys and, and ladies that had to get out of retirement um, pulling out all these like you know ring binders of documents <laughs> to basically keep the plants running while all the computers were out of action. Um, so and that's that's what they've been doing. I think they've they've just been looking at hey, you know who's who's like I said either got cash so cash rich companies uh, or people with cyber insurance. So with and that, that, I think it's, it's for you know they go and look for companies. You know you look at the classic infiltration now. You know they they get on the network and what are they looking for? They're looking to exfiltrate data on what's your financial situation and what's your cyber insurance policy. Sure. They and, basically and, and, ransom you for what your cyber insurance covers you for. <laughs> they're not stupid. Yeah, they're looking for what they're going to pay out. No, it, make, it makes absolute sense. And, you know, with that, I think it's important to, to get across. And, and I've certainly seen this over the last few months. And, and I think it'd be good really for you to cover it as well. Is you know, Do we think that cyber criminals have simply over the last six or seven months just become more sophisticated? Now, I personally don't think so. Um, I think they're operationalizing better. Uh, and I think, I think, as you said, like they're they're doing their research, they're doing their homework. Um, but really, I, I'm, I'm seeing reports, and I'm like, cyber criminal, cyber criminals being more sophisticated. For me, they've always been fairly sophisticated to a certain extent. Um, I don't know what, what's your thoughts on that. So I think, I think a number of things have caused the change in in the last sort of, I'd say more like twelve months. Um, but I think. Yes, they got more organized. Uh, I think yes. they realized uh, they could make a lot more money. And with making a lot more money, you can get more organized. It's a classic, you know, money is the grease that oils the machine. If you like, the more of it you've sure. got, the better your machine runs uh, to a degree. Um, I think the other thing a lot of research has been showing, uh, a lot of intel, um, is that a lot of the cyber criminal gangs have uh, links to the nation state um, military, for want of a better word, uh, yeah. cyber teams. They're funded uh, in certain what, places. What it seems to be is a lot of them work for the military and then kind of work in the evenings for a cyber crime gang. Uh, how accurate this is, I don't know, but it does kind of make sense. 
Um, and what we've seen happening is as a nation state attack vector gets disclosed and discovered, uh, suddenly the cybercrime gangs start using it. So it's almost like they've been told, hey, you can't use this avenue while we're using it for intelligence gathering. But once it's public domain, then it's fair game. Um, it looks like to me. Uh, and I think that's what that's what we're kind of seeing at the moment is they getting access to much more advanced tools, uh, much better Intel um, and using those two to, to better advantage. I, I agree with you. I don't think they've particularly got more sophisticated. We're not seeing anything groundbreaking in the attack vector space. Let's put it this way. Same. Story. Yeah, I they're hitting us with phishing, you know, so they're relying on the human error, um, which I guess, you know, that's kind of one of those things, isn't it? Um, people make mistakes. It's it's an it's an easy one to exploit, um, and they're hitting companies that are are likely to be vulnerable. Uh, so that just tells me that they've got better research teams. Um, yeah, they're they're doing the homework. I think is the, the, the important factor. More organized, rather than more sophisticated. I think yeah. that's I think that absolutely articulates it in that sense. Is it's not necessarily sophistication. I think that's the important area there. It's we're not seeing this from a different lens, and I think also. You know, one of the areas for me that I think is really evident is opportunistic as well. But the pandemic created so many opportunities. You know, security postures were, were turned on their head. Um, organizations just simply weren't ready for work from home environments. Applications shifted to the cloud overnight because we just had to continue to work. It was, there was a plan B, C, D didn't even come into effect. It was what's plan Z here? Let's, let's get moving. And, and with that, you know, one thing that I think is is really interesting is the fact that we're seeing dwell time. We're really seeing true dwell time of organization, bad actors and organizations. The bad actors are really choosing their time to strike. You know, I, I framed this um, not so long ago around it's almost like putting the cards on their table. You know, they're choosing when their time is to strike. They're choosing when they want to attack that particular organization. It, it really puts us into a position where without that visibility and context of your environment, um, you can actually be in an extremely vulnerable state and without putting that that, that you know, security posture, security protocols in place. And, uh, and that leads me into, you know, really our second topic of today as well. And something I know that's really close to your heart and something that we spoke about just a few weeks ago as well. You know, ultimately it goes without saying that, you know, in, the, in March, 2020, we always use that, that pinpoint of a date as such um, into where the majority of countries started to go into lockdown or the majority of countries started to ask people to work from home, you know, the headline news, work from home and so on and so forth. You know, naturally, VMware had to go through that exactly, exactly the same process. So, you know, first and foremost, it's kind of shift before that, because you've been part of this, uh, obviously, before the pandemic as well. How prepared were VMware before um, to secure a remote workforce? How prepared were you? Uh, we Well, we've always run uh, a remote workforce. All we did was increase the numbers, if you think about it. Um, yeah. you know, we, we've got, uh, it's in the thousands, I don't remember how many thousands, of salespeople. Uh, they don't sit in an office. Uh, they're on customer sites. That's, that's how our sales organization works, right? We're very customer facing. Uh, we've got a huge PSO uh, workforce. Likewise, the, you know, they sat in customer premises. You know, I was one. You know, uh, <laughs> if I was in the office, it was a rarity. Um, I yeah. was more often either working from home or working on a customer site uh, or sat in an airplane. Um, so, and I think, well, this is a VMware session, so I can talk about our products. Uh, we, of were, you can. we are we are exceptionally lucky as a company. Um, with our product portfolio. Um, Workspace One is such a fantastic product. I think a lot of people see it as kind of like a end user compute product, but as a security yeah. professional, what it gives us um, is fabulous. Uh, you know, the insight, the, the control we've got over endpoints, and that's, to me, that's where everything shifted last March. It's, you know, everybody suddenly woke up to the fact that on-premise security is no longer effective. It wasn't way before March. You know, it, it hasn't been for years, but a lot of companies still operate that mindset of, hey, well, as long as people are in the office, we've got all these compensating controls around that mitigate the risk. 
and suddenly everyone started working from home or you know wherever they can get internet connectivity from and with whatever device they could get internet connectivity with as well that was a you know i think a lot of us in like sort of especially the sort of more european or north american countries you know we're quite used to having our own device you know we've all got our own laptop uh, we've yeah. almost all of us got a smartphone of some sort uh, not every country has that luxury you know so that was one of our challenges actually in march last year was actually provisioning the people that traditionally used to go into the office and work on the desktop to enable them to be able to work remotely so that's, that's that really was, that's really in yeah, that's really interesting, and, and that kind of leads me into the second part because, and then and 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 I'd love to dig deeper into that because mm. you know as we were going into lockdown and we could almost to a certain extent predict the path that we were on to a certain extent. Um, what was it like in the couple of weeks? Let's frame it around that a couple of weeks during that time where we knew that you know I remember I was actually in Vienna. Would you believe? So I was in Vienna, and I remember Alex sending out that email on the 1st of March, saying that we all have to work from home and, and so on and so forth. And I remember receiving that email and thinking, wow, my flight's not for another 15 hours. Um, you know, where does that leave me? I didn't know what I was kind of had to do. And, you know, I knew I had to get home. Um, were travel going to cancel my flights? All of those questions going through my head. And um, from that email being sent up until, I guess, really the two weeks after where lockdown started to be implemented, what was that period of time like and what things did you guys have to do from a security aspect to really make sure that you prepared for the months ahead? Uh, uh, bluntly, we didn't do a heck of a lot because we were ready. Um, frankly, <laughs> you know, no, it's, um, great. It, it's a scenario we had planned out. Um, you know, we, one of, we, we do tabletop exercises uh, fairly regularly as a, I mean, the, the name's on the t-shirt just so security and resiliency uh it's kind of yep. written in our mandate yeah um, so we we do planning for that kind of stuff um we'd always considered that eventuality um you know pandemic what happens um i don't i don't you know it's kind of one of those things we we never anticipated a worldwide lockdown <laughs> for sure um, you know you you kind of expect stuff to get contained a lot faster so that that bit took and most of the thinking genuinely was around uh, how do we look after our people? Um, how do we yeah. make sure? Um, and, you know, it's the stuff a lot of people don't think about. How do we make sure it people is. don't work too much? It sounds weird for a company, but it was a genuine concern in those first couple of months. Because the hassle is you sat at home, you've got nothing else to do pretty much. Um, and so people were working. They were working ridiculous amounts of hours. Um, and we needed to find ways as a, as a resiliency function. And I know this is very very much a passion of Alex's as, as the head of the crisis management team, was how do we look after people come first at VMware and, and very much resonates throughout the, the kind of, if you like, the support organization, IT, security, because that's how we see ourselves. We see ourselves as supporting uh, colleagues out in, the, out in the world, if you like, whether they're sales, PSO, marketing, you guys, um, you know. <laughs> um, so and everyone that's else. Kind of where we were focused for those couple of weeks is like, right, how did, like I said, how do we get the people that don't have a device a device if they need one? Um, how do we make it appropriate for people to share a device at home? Because that was another big concern, um, you know, because we knew people were, the schools were closing, and so kids were all going through the virtual learning. Uh, very few schools had made much provision to enable virtual learning. Uh, they you know, certainly in the number of the geographies that we, we operate in, we found schools just made the assumption that the parents would have a machine at home, which yeah. is an invalid assumption. The problem with that assumption was the parent is using said machine to earn the money. Uh, so now you've got the scenario of, you know, the, the school wants this kid online from, you know, 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. or whatever, and that's just a peak work time for the adults in the house. So, so how do we make that work? Uh, so there was a lot of consideration for that kind of stuff. Um, security, it was really, wise, you know, it was really a, it was really a people. It was really a people consideration, though. That's a really, I think, two uh, two areas that you mentioned there, which I think, uh, you know, for all the listeners, are really important. Is around, um, it was really a people consideration. You know, we really had, and we first and foremost, we practiced this. That that was the important thing. We practiced it with 
has paired for this eventuality. Okay, not necessarily on the scale, but we've certainly prepared. And secondly on that as well is the biggest consideration, and that's almost a privilege to be in that position to a certain extent, is we could put the people first. We could really start to focus on people from that point of view. Craig, I know that you know we're, we're, we're running through the uh, session, so I know that you and I spoke at Security Connect uh, a few weeks ago and, and, uh, and did a, a session around, um, around Zero Trust as well. I know something that's you know, really interesting to yourself. So you know, from, to kind of frame the last part of this uh, session, you know, why, why do you think that Zero Trust is so important as we have a work from anywhere environment with our applications in the cloud and and and, and if you could if you can give us an insight into how vmware implements um, zero trust as well uh, and why we think it's so you know important to such a large organization so i i'm going to give you that with my lens if you like which is the people and process one rather than technology. sounds great a lot of people are very technology focused when it comes to zero trust which is not necessarily a bad thing um, but I would say the, the biggest advantage of Zero Trust right now and the fact that it's it's getting so much airtime is it's driving the culture change, You're not just in security, but in IT ops and in business ops as well. You look at how long it took us as security professionals just to drive the concept of defense in depth home. Right, just to get companies to understand that yes, you do need firewalls around your network perimeter. You can't just hook up directly to the internet. You can't rely on a switch to provide, you know, uh, that kind of stuff. You know, it took us a long time to get that um, into the the sort of business consciousness, if you like. And to me, that's one of the biggest points of Zero Trust. It's it's a fantastic architectural framework. It's got a great focus. You know, applications and data. That's really where the focus needs to be. You know. Um, and to me, what wraps around that is the user. If you put your users first, you think about how do I make sure my users operating securely, what does that give you as an outcome? Well, it gives you secure apps and data, doesn't it? You know, it gives you a direct route because that's what your user is accessing. <laughs> right? uh, they are accessing the app and consuming or using the data. Um, so that to me is, I think, and that's certainly the lens we as, as VMware have put in it. You know, yes, we have a lot of technology. Uh, we use a look, pretty much every single one of our products, frankly. Um, but that's kind of our focus is like kind of how do we drive application and data security by making sure our colleagues have an excellent experience? Because if the colleagues having an excellent experience, and it's really easy to operate securely, they don't have any need to go and find a way around it. You know, you think yeah. about, the, you know, the old school days where, you know, you went to a website or, you know, an internal service rather, and suddenly you had to put in a, a token code and you had to go and find the stupid doofer, you know, push a button. Usually be on my like house keys code. that I left in the car or something exactly. like that. You know, yeah. or you've left them at home, now you're finding wife. Hey, sorry, can you go and find this thing? Push a button. <laughs> Tell me the token code, code. yeah. And, you know, <laughs> and if you're holding it upside down by mistake and it's giving you, you know, the wrong, yeah, blah, it was horrible. So people found ways around that, right? <laughs> they always did. Very much so. Because if it's awkward, humans will find an easier path. Humans, you know, and apologies to anyone who's not, but in my opinion, most humans are fundamentally lazy. Um, and so what we're looking for is the easiest route to achieve the outcome we're aiming for, right? Because why would you want to is do it, it the hard way? Uh, you know, which is why I don't understand people who love going to gym. But that's a different story. <laughs> <laughs> I won't tell you that I went for a run about seven hours ago, but we'll no, we'll that's part fine. That one. You, you run away from your peers. You keep going. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of how we do it. Because yeah, we can put. You know, if you think about it, you've got users, you've got networks, um, and you've got systems. We can do networks and system security till the cows come home. You, you can <laughs> you can layer that stuff as much as you like. You've still got to give your users access to the apps and data. Yeah. Right? That that's what's got to happen. That's what those other interim steps exist for, is to connect your user to whatever they're doing. Now, if you make sure your user's relatively secure, or at least you've got the telemetry to tell you when something's gone wrong, then the rest of the stuff kind of works in concert. But if you haven't ensured your user's secure, or at least you know, reasonably well trained, because that's the other side of this is how do you educate the human um you know to spot a phishing email they've got a lot more sophisticated frankly um if you've you know harking back to saying did this criminals get more sophisticated 
Yeah, they got smarter with their phishing emails. That's the one thing I would give them. We'll give them one piece of credit yeah. today. We'll do that. They got that right. <laughs> um, you know, the user's going to make that mistake, so you have to plan for it. You can do what you can to, to limit the user, A, making the mistake or the impact of that mistake, but you have to accept mistakes are going to get made. You know, And that's the other thing that I really like with Zero Trust is Zero Trust embraces that concept. Whereas a lot yeah. of previous security mindsets was kind of like, oh, we need to get the user out of the picture. <laughs> it's like, it's well, never going to be out of the picture. picture. What are you doing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? I mean, yeah, great. You know, automate, uh, orchestrate that. Those things are all important. But fundamentally, somewhere in there lives a human because... Uh, that's what we're doing. You've got to, what, what you're touching on there is, is, is so important and truly resonates, you know, it really resonates to, you've got to enable the user. You have to make sure the user is part of that process, part of that strategy and, and enabled, enabled to do their job. Otherwise you're going to find ways around it. Craig, this has been, sorry, this has been truly exhilarating. This really has it. And, you know, I'm just looking on the Q and A as well as, as we speak. And, and, and I know there's, you know, from that point of view, there's people. Um, we've got California Republic, Colorado. Uh, so we've got yourself and we've got Chris Roll as well. Um, Austin, Texas, Florida, California, uh, Indiana, Oklahoma. I'm not seeing any Europeans on today, which I was hoping we would. But uh, Oklahoma, um, five, five oh, days. The, the weather's really nice in the UK, so they're probably all in the beer garden, frankly. Well, it's, I'm... I'm I know what am I doing? That's that's the question that I need to, yeah. to ask myself. Where where should I be? Um, Rick saying that five day a week and James is slacking. I'll get you back on that one, Rick. Um, but no, honestly, this has been truly exhilarating. And 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 to frame this up, you know, I think what we're really saying there, and, and I really wanted to say this at the end because I think we need to give credit. No doubt where credit's due, first and foremost, but I lived through it and I lived it as an end user. I was the user in that scenario that you just framed. And I know I said this to you a couple of weeks ago and I wanted to say it to everybody else as well. What the truly exhilarating part for me is when I got that email from Alex back in March 2020 and I was then at home. So I went, drove from Heathrow up the motorway where I live at, at, at home. I never left that home again in reality. But I never worked anywhere else. What I didn't see is I, I actually didn't see any change. My laptop didn't change. Um, the way I logged in didn't change. The way I accessed things didn't change. Actually, nothing changed on my side. And I, thought, I found that really empowering as a user, that I wasn't asked upon anything. I wasn't told, oh, James, you need to go and implement X, Y, Z to get yourself in the position where you can work from home. I wasn't sent something for the post or anything like that. And I think we should be really proud as an organization, truly should be really proud as an organization. And you should certainly be proud to be able to really live through that and operationalize an organization and give everybody listening here today as well, really the truth of the fact that it is achievable. We can get to a position where we can survive security strategies and moving to modern day security technology, security strategies, and putting people first as well, which is a really important area you spoke about today. It's all a part of that, but really giving the confidence to the industry as well, that we can do this, we can do this, and we can achieve it. And, and not to be put off as well by the simple cyber insurgency that we've seen over the last few months. And, and it is an opportunity, you know, it really is an opportunity from um, the, the bad guys taking advantage of the time. But we can win that. We can win this war, I think, is really uh, from that point of view. Why are us working together, James? Uh, it's something I think we as a security industry are seeing. Uh, yes. We've got to stop seeing each, uh, ourselves as isolated bastions. Uh, we are interconnected, and we need to start dealing with security in an interconnected fashion. I couldn't uh, agree with you more. We've got to get better at sharing intel. We've got to get better at speeding up. The, the sharing of, of information because you can be sure our our adversaries are you know they you, know, you can you know, what was this one just recently darknet or whatever is ransomware yeah, dark is a side. service yeah dark, dark side yeah. you know ransomware is a service it's a thing now you know you go on the dark web and you go hey i you know i've got a way into this company uh, i'll split the you know whatever the split is <laughs> you guys deliver me some ransomware i'll deliver you the route in hey sweet um that kind of cooperation is happening on that side of the fence. We've got to get the same sort of cooperation going now, you know, and uh, that's where I think 
certainly as a security industry, uh, it's time to step up to that and move into right. How do we how do we start tackling this together, rather than what a way point project? Yeah, what a, what what a way to finish off today's Craig, session, Craig. I think that's a truly humbling point that you've just made there. Um, we're all in this together. You know, we're in this for a wider challenge and a wider objective and ultimately we're here to make sure that the world is a safer place against cyber attacks you know and craig it's honestly been an absolute honor to host you on today's session and sharing your expert insights or expert knowledge for the cyber community and um, i want to do this again whether we can do it live at um vm world or we can set up another session we can get out to palo alto we can we're going to do something, I can promise you that. And we're going to talk, hopefully post-pandemic, about <laughs> VMware strategy moving forward. Let, let's let's do that. But Craig, it's been an absolute okay. honor. Thank you, for, Thank you for joining me today. Thank you very much, James. No, it's and been yes, an absolute pleasure. We will be, we will be at VMworld. <laughs> we will be. We will be at VMworld. And, and to all our listeners today as well, thank you so much for attending the Ask the Howler session. Um, um, of course, the Cybersecurity Expert Roundtable for security leaders such as yourselves. Um, it's an honor to host you, as always. It's an honor to have fantastic uh, guests like Craig, uh, Rick, Tom, Sonara, David, everyone we've had over the last few months. Before I go, I do have two things that I will probably lose my promotion if I don't tell you about these. So I'm going to make sure I tell you. And first off, I'm always keen to focus um, the topics that you're interested in. So as listeners, I want you guys to be choosing the topics that we talk about. So please submit them, drop them into the uh, drop them into the comment section, submit them over. You can email me, you can contact me on jaliband at vmware.com. I'm going to regret sending that out now. Um, I need to set up a new uh, Ask the Howlers email address to filter these through. We'll get there. Um, and of course, we'll select one of our viewer selections to, uh, to set up the next Ask the Howlers live stream. Secondly, as I pointed earlier, Craig joined myself and I joined Craig on a session about, VM, uh, about Zero Trust a couple of weeks ago at Security Connect. The session, the, the event, sorry, was fantastic. 3,000 people joined us live at Security Connect. We're going to do it live in person next year, but we made such a success of it um, virtually this time. But it is still on demand. It is virtual and it's free. Most importantly, it's free. To so go and watch the sessions back, there were so many awesome pieces of content from Rick, from Tom, from Sonara, of course, from Craig as well as other sessions that Craig did, and all of our howlers across experts across VMware, um, joining you there to give you insights into latest security innovations, um, hear, hearing from our leaders, our executive team around our security strategy as an organization, as VMware. Craig showed you and given you some insights in today and how we did it as an organization. So you can start to go and implement that yourselves as well. Um, so please go and check that out. You can see the links in the chat now as I've just been speaking. So thank you for sending those over and go and join in them, set up the sessions. But with no further ado, I'm going to close the session out. Thank you for joining me from wherever you've been, whether you've been across the US, across Europe, across APJ. Thank you so much. I'm going to go and sit in the sun and soak up that last bit of sun I've got. Craig, you've got a few more hours than I have. Um, so thank you so much, everyone. Take care and see you soon. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.